So are you liable if someone gets sick in a building that you're taking care of? Well, the short answer is we don't know. You could be. But hey, why even take a chance? In part four of indoor air quality, Control Pro Tim Chambly is going to walk you through steps you can take to make sure that some lawyers not going through your PM reports trying to pin something on you if somebody should get sick. We're also going to talk about UV lights and an alternative to that, a very exciting alternative to UV lights that's less expensive and requires less maintenance. We're going to get into ventilation. We're going to get into filtration. We're also going to get into economizers and why they're important. Plus, we're going to talk about a concept called demand control ventilation based on CO2. Hi, Control Pro. This is Eric Stromquist with Stromquist Company and ControlTrends.com. In this video, we're going to continue with Tim Chambly, the Control Pro from Atlanta, Georgia. So I hope you enjoy episode four. We got, we got one more episode after this, which is complete the indoor air quality training. So hey, if you're liking this, please subscribe to the channel before. Give us a like. Give us a comment. We'll see you on the flip side. Uh, ION. It's uh, called a OH minus uh, uh, ion. It's a very stable ion. It's called hydroxyl. You can uh, Google it. Uh, the OH ion is what goes through your coil, and it will clean the coil because what it does is, if it finds a biological something, it will strip an H to make dihydrogen monoxide. Have you ever heard of dihydrogen monoxide? Everyone who consumes it dies. <laughs> Eventually. Uh, H2O water. The biological thing dies. Water vapor is formed. No big deal. Nothing hurt except the uh, mold, mildew, whatever, bacteria. Uh, so this hydroxyl ion is a wonderful thing. The UV is a wonderful thing. The downside of UV is you got to change your bulbs periodically. Um, they used to say every year, now they're saying, well, they, they've kind of tweaked the bulbs and so you get about 18 months, sometimes two years depending on the manufacturer, but they're, they're not cheap. So uh, in a whole building or a campus or whatever, you're spend, spending tremendous amounts of money changing your UV lights. Now there's another way to do it that's very effective. And uh, that's, you know, get a uh, generator, a hydroxyl energy, uh, a generator or an ion, bipolar ion generator. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Uh, there's uh, different types on the market. I don't care the brand. All I care is what it does. I'm brand agnostic. Um, they can be very expensive. Uh, we've got one that is about, actual size is about that big. Got two little whiskers. You put 24 volts to it. So if you got small system wired across CNG, powers it, makes about 9,000 volts. If you uh, power it up, put it on your desk, put your hand above it, you feel the ions just boiling off. And it does a couple things. It will take the air, uh, those ions in the air, and they will do the sterilizing effect. Uh, it also will magnetize the particles and make them clump together so they actually will be able to be filtered out. How much square footage is that? Effect? Well, one of these units, the manufacturer says 1800 CFM. I say, no, let's derate that and say about 1200, about three tons. So if you've got a 30 ton uh, air handler, put 10 of them in there on a you know, piece of angle iron, turn them upside down, whiskers down, not up because crap will build up and uh, it'll short out, whiskers down, and it will be very effective. Now, uh, the reason I can say that with confidence is not because of what any of these companies have told me. It's uh, there's a uh, there's a sizable aquarium in the nation, one of the largest aquariums in the nation. Don't want to say where it is, but it's not too far from here. Uh, they put ten of them in a thirty-ton air handler, and uh, on an annual basis. Industrial hygienist does a swab test, put it in a petri dish, see what grows. Every year they do this. So a couple years ago they do that test, then right after that test 
they do this retrofit so the next year he's been installed for better part of a year and industrial hygienist says man <laughs> your tests have never come back this good since we've been doing this and the only thing they did is put this in so that's a third party verification that I like and uh, also they said they got a sushi room cut up the fish to feed the fish sounds a little cannibalistic to me but uh, <laughs> that sushi the smell was so stifling you almost could not go in that room. Uh, the people that work in the room, they, they get nose blind to it after a while, but passing through, it'll, it's awful. Uh, a couple months ago, I was up there and went through the room and I did smell some uh, you know, fish odor. It wasn't bad, it was there. And uh, the director of maintenance said, uh, you should have smelled it before. <laughs> it's, and, and, you know, so uh, this place is a believer. So I like UV. It's just kind of expensive for the maintenance. I love hydroxyl ion, the, the bipolar ionization. They both work very well. This just lasts longer as long as the whiskers are not sticking up in the air. Uh, so horizontal or, or pointed down, got a little LED light, as long as the light's lit, you're fine. They last a long time. So uh, that was a little bit of a trail, but I think good, helpful information. Now, filtration, very, very important. Um, our, 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 the ratings of filters have changed. Now they've gone into what they call MERV. Um, and, and let's look at what the MERV rating, I, I want you to have an understanding, and I've got a couple of, of uh, s slides that explain this. Your, uh, your real cheap throwaway fiberglass uh, uh, 50 cent filters, one inch filters, they're very low MERV. Uh, by the way, if you want to see how effective these spun glass, uh, fiberglass filters are, Take one brand new, take a salt shaker and do like this and see if it actually filters out the salt. Okay. Uh, your pleated filters, uh, they have, depending on, on what brand and, and quality, they're right around MERV uh, 10 and 11. Uh, typically that's what you have in your buildings. Uh, you've got 65%, which is uh, hitting MERV 13. Uh, MERV 14 is much better. Now let's put some real numbers to those previous numbers of MERV numbers. What it, what they, how they rate the MERV ratings is based on particle size, and they'll have three ranges of particles. Uh, range one is 0.3 to 1 micron, and uh, 1 to 3, and then 3 to 10. So these are BBs, these are marbles, these are golf balls, so to speak. And uh, if you have a MERV 1 through 4, it's not very effective on the largest range of this scale. Like I say, your, your spun glass, uh, uh, just the panel filters, it won't, you, you can shake salt through them. <laughs> They don't catch much. All right, so uh, they were talking over here The 30% is like MERV 11 and 12, so in this range. So now you're just starting to get the small particles. You're not very effective on the small ones. Uh, you're pretty effective on the big particles. Now, I want you to imagine this. Take a marble and throw at a chain link fence. How effective will that chain link fence filter out the marble you throw at it? it it's real good if you throw a basketball, <laughs> but not the marbles and certainly not the BBs. All right, now, uh, on this previous thing, uh, it says most filters protect equipment. Filters are not for us. It's to keep from clogging up our core, uh, our, our coals. All right, here's why. 
getting into the MERV ratings and, and the higher rated MERV filters. To, to really get down to the small particles, we have to be in the neighborhood of MERV 13 and 14. It restricts your airflow, and that hurts your whole system. So it, there's a trade-off. Now, we can take, instead of having them flat, we can go to a, a V-bank. That gives you more surface area for less pressure drop, and that helps. Now, let me tell you the issue of filtration relative to us, not equipment, okay? Now, there is a range particle size, and I wish this MERV rating system would kind of mimic this. It doesn't, so you, you're going to have to do some interpolation into what I say in, and overlay it on, on the MERV. All right, 0. 0.5 to 5 microns, that's the range I want you to consider. Over five microns, our body has defenses to filter out the big boulders. All right, so five microns and larger, our bodies can handle. Now that, you know, we got one to three, we got three to 10, so, you know, you, you see what I'm talking about is, is you, you have to do a little uh, interpolation. So the big stuff that you, you start filtering out 20 to 35 percent or maybe uh, with a uh, you get into MERV 7 you're doing all right if you get into a MERV 10 to 11 actually it's doing a good job on the big pieces but we don't know I mean that's including 10 microns so if we go to this range 3 microns well the MERV uh, 10 11 is somewhat effective all right, so I'm, I'm trying to set up something that you can just, you, you can relate to. Now, the five microns larger, our body can handle it, it's no big deal. We have cilia, we have mucus, we, we have defenses uh, built in. Now, if we go to the 0.5 and smaller range, those particles, as we breathe in, they come in and they exit the body. They're not filtered out. They come in, they come out. They typically don't impinge on the bron bronchial sacs. If they do, our uh, immune system can deal with them. So big is okay. Little, tiny is okay. The 0 0.5 to 5 micron range is what they call non-respirable range. That's the range where as we breathe those tiny particles in, they'll impinge and they'll stay there and not be ex exhaled. So once they're in your body, they're a foreign object. Now your immune system has to you know, kick in and, and deal with them. And if you've got a good, strong immune system, it, you know, it's usually no big deal. If you have a compromised immune system, you got a problem. 0.5 to 5 micron. Try to relate it to, to the MERV range. What, micron, what MERV filter do we need for, for our health? What would you say? And, and, you know, it, it's, it's a judgment call. Are you going to put MERV 13 or 14 on your equipment? Probably not. It, it, it's very expensive and it's just, you know, now HEPA filters. It's 99.97% of everything 0.3 microns and larger, it's a rating. Those are very good. So if, if you want a personal filter that's good for your health, get a HEPA filter. So, and you can get a tabletop model and, and all that, but that's not going to help a big building. If you have somebody that's in an office that's sensitive, throw a HEPA filter 
tabletop type thing or you know over there in the corner. Okay, make sense? Let's see how we're doing on time. Oh my, about 45 minutes. This is a big top topic for two hours. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, it, it depends. Now the question is box filters. Well, you know they have, uh, you know the the four inch panel, the six inch panel, twelve inch. You got bags. Best thing to do is look at the manufacturer if it's uh, far or camp, you know wh whatever. Get the the data sheet for that model filter, and it'll give you the MERV rating. That way, we're not guessing. Okay, uh, here's something kind of nice. We have a get a box sample of air. If we were to you know get down small enough and and be able to count the particles in this much air. Uh, cubic foot, it's not a whole lot. It's saying we've got, what about 90, I mean 20 million particles in that. Of the 20 million, 19 and a half million are one micron and smaller. 18 and a quarter, 0.5 micron and smaller, which, that's good news, because 0.5 and smaller is less respirable. It's less impactful. So you know we've we've got the um, a couple million particles that eh, kind of not so good for our health. And this is a slide giving you the relative size of particles. Now here's something that's really interesting. Do we have? Uh, Oh, goodness, I do not see, to, oh yes, I do see it, tobacco smoke. How many of you have ever seen an air cleaner demonstration? And, and they say, let me show you how good our air cleaner is. We're going to take this little box, we're going to blow, you know, take a squeeze bulb and get some cigarette smoke in there, and then we're going to flip the switch and our air, uh, this little gizmo that cleans the air, right before your eyes. That smoke disappears. Has anybody ever seen that? That's the oldest trick in the book. <laughs> Do you, what did you see? Did you see the cigarette smoke? The answer is no. I can't see cigarette smoke because cigarette, cigarette smoke, tobacco smoke, is so small it has to be much larger before we can see it without a microscope. Well, darn, I've seen people smoking all my life, and I thought I saw that smoke. No, what you see is a product of combustion. A product of combustion is water vapor. That's what you see is water vapor. So if you get somebody that does a demonstration, hey, this is how effective our air cleaner is on cigarette smoke. What they're showing you is how effective it is on water vapor. Don't fall for it. All right. Um, oh, this is a interesting fact. If I took and grabbed a small particle and held it, you know, above the floor, dropped it. If it was a rock, you know, 100 microns, it's pretty large, it's gonna settle in about eight seconds, it'll hit the floor. If it's 0.1 microns, and I let go, 0.1 micron, it's gonna take forever. <laughs> so 79 days is a settling rate. So the smaller the particle, the more they tend to stay and remain, they remain airborne. Now, remember what I said about this little bipolar ion thing? It will make these small particles attract so that they can be filtered out. That's, that's kind of a, a handy little thing. All right. All right, so we've talked about the issue of indoor air quality. 
In the small amount of time we have left, let's talk about controls. In small buildings, your control typically is just a thermostat, <laughs> okay? Make and break based on temperature has nothing to do with humidity. If we control to temperature, the, we expect the humidity to kind of follow if things are properly sized. Now, if you have an oversized air conditioner, what it will do is it will satisfy on temperature before it's had time to pull enough humidity out of the air to be effective. And you will feel cold and clammy. So in our industry, bigger is not better. Although we have to size according to worst case conditions, so everything's oversized. So it's a little bit of a problem. All right, so we typically will have just thermostats. Now, that used to be the old uh, mercury style, then we went to the snap switch, then we went to the electronic. Now, uh, we're, we're getting thermostats that are very, very smart, and I love them. Because some of these smart thermostats, the Wi-Fi thermostats, uh, there's apps, uh, just gives you information that's great. I've got a thermostat on my wall, you know, runs my house that I can look back and see uh, the run minutes for heat last year, this year, <laughs> cool last year, this year. It gives me grass. Man, it's wonderful. I love to see it. Um, now, in, in our commercial buildings, Maybe we can use Wi-Fi, but that would be a small building. If it's a bigger building, you need something with uh, a little bit more robust communication protocols, and we do have those type. Um, and they can work uh, with BACnet. Some of you know what BACnet is. Um, it's just a, a language where systems can talk, gather information, and share information. Uh, now, you can uh, go, you know, there's Zigbee, and that's just having an array of devices, thermostats, and other things that cross talk, and it, it just builds a met, what they call a mesh network so that if you've got information on a device over here and it needs to get to the uh, computer way over there, it and you know it can't communicate directly it can take devices that's in between and they act like repeaters so to speak and with a mesh network if you have a device failure you don't necessarily lose communication because it the system will reroute the information so uh, backnet very good very handy Zigbee, very good, very handy. They are different. Um, now, we talked a little bit at the beginning about, you know, you buy a five-ton rooftop, you typically have an economizer. Now, uh, back uh, uh, ASHRAE 90.1 2007 saying, okay, in zones, uh, here's a map of the United States uh, with zones that's saying that uh, Florida uh, and parts of Texas, Louisiana, uh, and a little bit here on the left coast, you don't need an economizer, but then they amended those requirements and they say now uh, zones two through eight, which means Miami is excluded. <laughs> uh, Let's see, Guam and Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, if you're outside of that, if you have a system that has uh, greater than or equal to 54,000 BTUs, so about four and a half tons, you have to buy uh, this code, and, and your local codes usually adopt these codes. You gotta have an economizer. 
So, if you have a five-ton unit, you need an economizer. That economizer is very helpful because it does several things. If it's mild outside, you need cooling inside, instead of turning on that compressor, open up a damper, bring in uh, fresh air, gives you cooling, saves you money. You can al also have minimum uh, outside air so that you can have your ventilation air for a small job. Ventilation air with a big building, you usually have controls that can help you maintain that <coughs> balance of, uh, you know, to make sure you have enough ventilation air. With a small system, you just got a thermostat. Your controls don't understand ventilation, but if you have an economizer, then you can dial in some minimum outside air and that'll help. Another thing it'll do for you is you can integrate a CO2 sensor with many, many types, different brands of uh, economizer so that now you can do demand air ventilation. We, we, uh, made brief mention to it earlier. Demand air ventilation is saying, okay, we're going to check, we're going to measure and monitor CO2 levels in the space. We're going to send a signal out and say, we've got 800 parts per million in the space, which means you don't have a whole lot of bodies exhaling CO2 because that's where CO2 comes from, from people. All right, if you have lower population, then you need lower ventilation requirements. Then all of a sudden, it's a classroom, you get a bunch of uh, people in here, your CO2 levels go up, your damper, outside air damper, automatically responds to bring in more fresh air. So what that allows you to do is instead of sizing dampers and outside air CFM and all that for worst case scenario, and when you only have two people, you still are bringing in all that ventilation air. It allows your system to throttle back and bring in less outside air <coughs> because it's not needed. But to be able to do that, you need to be able to monitor. Make sense? That's simple. Demand air ventilation is a beautiful thing. However, there's a, uh, and you know, you get a variety of brands that can do that, but here's some issues. Here, 1999, failure rates of economizers are at 50% or higher. Then we go to 2001, they, they did a survey and said that 75% of uh, rooftops suffer from economizer malfunction. Then they go to 2002 and the survey says 70% 70 of the units suffer from broken economizers. So we had a little bit of an improvement uh, over this year. And then uh, in 2003, it says 10% of the economizers weren't even properly installed and set up. So if, the, if they're not right from the start, then what good are they? Um, and then, you know, so you can see just because you have an economizer does not mean it's going to do a good job. It's got to be properly set up and maintained. And, and maintained. Well, <laughs> and the question is, is the cost of maintenance on these things worth uh, having them? Well, for one thing, code requires. And two, if you get somebody that's in this space, and they watch PBS, and that PBS th th documentary is about someone that gets sick from the building air. Then they get to, you know, she talks to her husband, or he talks to her, or whatever. Or let, I guess I should say, the person talks to her significant other. I, I, I want to stay out of trouble here. And says, you know, I haven't been feeling good lately. I think I'm getting sick. I think that, and you go to a doctor, and you can always find a doctor that will reinforce that. Next thing you know, you're on a witness stand in a lawsuit. And the, the attorney against you 
is asking you some pointed questions that's going to expose whether or not you are doing your due diligence. Not so All right. much the, the 20% of fresh air Okay, all right, so what, what your concern is, all right, I'm not worried about the... Uh, the degrees during the winter and those mm -hmm. dampers don't control because your PM guy didn't check mm -hmm. the leakage or anything like that. That's right. Then you have a failure of your unit. That's, that's right. So the, uh, the issue is, you know, for our streaming audience, uh, okay, we've got an economizer, it's 20 degrees outside, it's letting in way too much outside air, 20 degree outside air, because the unit is malfunctioned. It has to be properly maintained and verified, proper function, or you are exposed to that problem and is it worth it? That's a good question. And, and that's something that you just have to decide uh, within your facility, you know, um, because you got to put it on the PM. Well, there you go. That was part four. Hey, if you're interested in one of these ionizers that Tim talked about, we stock them in Atlanta. I'll put a link below. Uh, you can use the code CT10, Control Trends 10, and get a 10% discount. These things are absolutely amazing. Uh, among other things, they eliminate odors. Uh, Tim talked a bit, bit about that. Plus, they make your indoor air environment a lot safer. So, so give one of those a try. Remember, use the code CT10. So go to stromquist.com. All right, HVAC Control Pro. Remember, be bold, stay in control, and be relevant. We'll see you on the flip side.